Hello and welcome to the web series, Zero PM Pieces. In the Zero PM Pieces, the researchers in the project will tell you about one piece of the Zero PM puzzle that they're working on. So without further ado, here comes a Zero PM piece. Welcome to this uh, Zero PM piece number 11 uh, on bioassays and EDA. Um, and uh, let's get started. My name is Timo Hamers uh, and uh, I not doing this all on my own at the Vrije Universiteit. I work together with uh, Marie van Duurse, uh, uh, our professor, with uh, Maxime Callier, our PhD student, and with Timo Bygildjev, who is our postdoc. Um, see if this works. No, it does not. Now it does. Okay, so um, we are we are all together in the in the zero pm project and um, uh, maybe we should uh, also consider the t uh, for zero pm because we're not only uh, working with persistent and mobile substances but also with toxic substances so our project is called uh, zero pm uh, but um, of course we're dealing with uh, vp and vm substances but also with pmts and uh, the t here stands for toxicity and that is the what our work is uh, all about um uh, as paracelsus already taught us um, in the end all chemicals are toxic uh, but uh, the goal of course in our uh, uh, work package and in our work also is to prioritize compounds based on their toxicity so what you see here is the schedule how Compounds are uh, classified as PM or PMT substances. So first there are the criteria for the persistent chemicals. Uh, if they are really persistent, then we look for the criteria for mobile. Uh, and if they also pass these criteria, then they are a PM substance. And if they are really very persistent and very mobile, then they are already a VPVM substance here. And then uh, both the type of compounds are then considered for their toxicity and there are criteria for that and in the end then they can become a PMT substance. So uh, also some VP and VM substances can in the end be PMT substances so they can have both uh, uh, classifications. Now what are the T uh, criteria? Um, this is also from the famous publication by Hans Peter and Sarah. Uh, First of all, the, the first uh, set of criteria are the REACH criteria uh, uh, put together in REACH Annex uh, 13. Uh, and then there are some, uh, if they uh, do, uh, if they obey these criteria, then they get the label T already toxic. Uh, but if they do not obey the criteria, there's a second set of criteria that we, that we can look at. As you can see, they have been defined here, uh, specifically for PM uh, substances. That leads them to the, to the label toxicity. And if they uh, do not obey these criteria, then we can still look at the Kramer classes. Uh, and if, if they fit into class three, they become they get the label potential toxic. And if they do not uh, fit into this class, then they are not toxic. Well, there are a few things uh, uh, on this slide to, to discuss. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't have uh, all the data as required here to make these kind of assessments for all the substances that we consider or suspect to be uh, PM substances. So we do not have all this data to make the uh, to, to make the assessment whether they are toxic, yes or no. Second of all, there is a point here that's called endocrine disruptors, and uh, as you may know, there's a lot of debate on uh, on the assessment of endocrine uh, uh, disrupting potencies. So far, very few compounds have really got the characterization of the, or the label of being an endocrine disruptor, uh, but many compounds are considered at least as potential endocrine disruptors. And um, um, to, to, to determine the endocrine disrupting potency, uh, many people are working very hard also to, uh, to adjust um, current uh, testing protocols uh, that we are really capable of uh, determining uh, the endocrine disrupting potency of chemicals. So it's not so easy to uh, currently to, to get the label endocrine disruptor. Moreover, there are more uh, toxic endpoints to look at, like for instance, immunotoxicity. There's a lot of attention for that going on now, which is not covered by these criteria. And in the end, uh, of course, uh, we also want to move over to more alternative models. Specifically, if we uh, if we if the, we consider alternatives for PM substances, and we need to we need to assess whether they, they also uh, obey the criteria of PM or not. 
uh, or if we uh, if we uh, come across uh, emerging chemicals of concern that uh, that also have PM substances. So we would like to uh, to move more into alternative models to get to T assessment. In the end, uh, we also would like to prioritize within uh, zero PM. And uh, what you see here on the screen is, uh, is a classification based on hazard. And uh, to prioritize, it's also important that we know what the risk is. Well, I'm sure that you all know the difference between the hazard and the risk, but it's always nice to illustrate it in a picture like this. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, the hazard uh, of, of a toxic compound is really considered as an intrinsic property. And if you look at the cartoon, the snake is exactly as poisonous in the in the right situation as in the left situation. That the, the property of the snake does not uh, really uh, di differ between the two situations. While in the left situation, the risk the risk is much higher because there is a probability of exposure, which is much less in the the, in the right situation here, uh, but here is really a situation of, uh, of exposure that may lead to risk. So if we classify compounds based on hazard only, uh, that we can do that to, to distinguish between uh, PM substances and non-PM substances, or PMT substances, I should say, and non-PMT substances. But uh, if we really want to prioritize, uh, we should also consider the risk. Now, what we do in uh, in uh, the work package six of zero PM is that we uh, uh, ultimately want to come to a kind of a risk assessment. And for that purpose, you need to know something about the hazard. And that is what we are going to determine in vitro. And that's what, where the rest of my presentation will be about. How, how do we do that in vitro? Uh, and we also uh, need the exposure. And uh, that is the work that Todd Gowen is doing uh, to get to an external exposure assessment. And the, the 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 integration of uh, of the external exposure and the in vitro uh, uh, hazard data, the toxicity data that we get from our assays, that is uh, then all integrated in the in the in vitro and in vivo modeling. And for that purpose, uh, that is the work that uh, Sylvia Escher is doing at uh, Fraunhofer Item. They are using these uh, quantitative in vitro in vivo extrapolation models uh, so that they can uh, translate the, the, the threshold values that we determine in our in vitro assays to, uh, to threshold values for the in vivo uh, situation, for instance, in concentration in plasma or in our specific tissues. And uh, what they also do there is then uh, get the external concentrations, the external exposure concentration of human and translate these into internal concentration. And if we know what the exposure is and if we know what the hazard is, then Paracelsus has taught us that we can also determine the risk of a compound. So ultimately the goal of our work package is to come to this kind of risk assessment that we have an idea about the exposure of a compound and that we have an idea about the hazard of a compound. And if, of course, if the hazard is low and the exposure is low, uh, we do not expect much risk. And the opposite is also true. If they're both high, then we expect a lot of risk. But uh, if the uh, exposure, for instance, is high, but the hazard is very low, then, uh, then we still end up, may end up in a, in a situation that is not so risky as you would only uh, expect based on the exposure and the opposite is true if we look along this axis. So that is the whole idea of why we want to use these in vitro bioassays. So uh, the first and the main goal why, why we use these in vitro bioassays is to make this toxicity profiling where we have a focus specifically on the endocrine disruption and on the immunotoxicity. And as you may know, we have selected uh, so far uh, three compound groups consisting of triazines, which have this structure here in common, uh, triazoles, uh, which have this structure here in common, and uh, perfluorinated compounds. And here's the most famous example, PFOS, uh, illustrated. So what we try to do is uh, to determine for uh, a set of uh, these compounds, as you can see, 16, 9 and 11, uh, what the uh, toxicity is or the hazard, I should say, towards uh, typical endpoints uh, related to endocrine disruption and immunotoxicity. And we do that in vitro. That means that we are not using, uh, uh, that we are not performing animal studies. Uh, we uh, mainly use uh, cell cultures. We also use 
isolated uh, um, uh, uh, proteins uh, and uh, we, we test them in uh, systems like this, as you see here. Uh, so these are uh, uh, cell flasks, uh, culture flasks, uh, petri dishes that was in the old days that we use them to, to, to culture cells, but now we move to smaller and smaller uh, units. As you can see here in wells plates we work, uh, here you see the six well plates, the 12, 24, 96. We also work in 384 wells plates nowadays. So in very small volumes, uh, we can do these uh, type of uh, experiments. In vitro means, of course, in glass. Uh, we do this mainly uh, in plastics, as you can see here. Um, as I said, it's uh, it's uh, uh, an alternative to animal uh, models, uh, uh, but we also use uh, zebrafish in our uh, screening and uh, for that purpose we use uh, zebrafish embryos, which uh, according to law at least are not considered as uh, animals uh, as long as they are not self-feeding. Uh, so we also work with uh, zebrafish embryos, specifically also in the immunotoxicity, as I will show you later. So what kind of assays do we run? Uh, for instance, we run reported gene assays and here you see an example of a uh, reported gene assay. How does that work? Well, if we are interested, for instance, if a compound is capable of uh, activating a receptor, in this case the estrogen receptor, uh, an estrogenic compound can, uh, can bind to this receptor in the cell and uh, then uh, the activated receptor uh, forms a dimer, so two become a couple. It's, uh, it's then uh, translocated to the nucleus of a cell where it binds to estrogen responsive elements and uh, that leads to the transcription and translation of genes that ultimately lead, lead to the production of proteins that have a certain function in the body. In this case, they lead to a feminizing effect. This is, this is the pathway as it happens in the body and we can mimic this pathway in, uh, or we can also make use of this pathway, I should say, if we have a cell culture. And what we do in these uh, reported gene assays is that we work with a genetically modified cell. So what we have there is that we uh, have put in a construct, a DNA construct, uh, in the nucleus of the, of the cell, so in the genome of the cell, and it, it is under the same control here, this estrogen responsive element, but then we, there is a foreign uh, reported gene here uh, introduced to this cell. And uh, if the whole pathway is activated again, ultimately a foreign protein is also uh, produced, which in this case is for instance, luciferase. And that is a reported protein that I can measure very easily if I uh, open my cells, I add the substrate for luciferase, then uh, luciferin is uh, broken down and that is uh, done under the production of light. So I can measure my light yield and the more light I measure, uh, the more estrogenic the compounds are that uh, my cells have been exposed to. So that's the idea of a reported gene assay. And Here's what you, what you get then, uh, those response curve in the end. So here you see the, the light yield on the y-axis, the concentration of estrogenic compound at the bottom, and you can see a nice uh, dose response curve there. You can also use these uh, type of assays to measure uh, uh, inactivation of the receptor. This is almost the same uh, picture that you see here, but now we combine, so we, we use an estrogenic compound to expose our cells to, and this is a test compound and imagine that our test compound is anti-estrogenic. Then it also binds to the estrogen receptor and it also forms these dimers, but in the end it's incapable of activating the, uh, the, the, the endogenous genes, but also the reported genes. So in the end, you will find no light. Uh, uh, the, the light production by the red estrogenic compound is basically then uh, diminished by the presence of an anti-estrogenic compound. So this is not happening and these pathways are, are really blocked because this is an inactivated receptor. And then you get something like this. So here you see the, the light yield of the estrogenic compound here, the maximum, and the more test compound I add, the less uh, uh, light I can measure. Um, we also have another uh, uh, endocrine disruption uh, related uh, uh, in vitro assay, which is the H295R uh, assay. Uh, so this makes use of uh, adrenocortical cells and uh, these cells possess the whole pathway to produce uh, steroid hormones. And uh, here you can see the, the synthesis pathway of, uh, of uh, steroid hormones. It all starts with cholesterol, as you may know. 
and uh, ultimately it produces the, the, the mineral corticoids, the, the glucocorticoids, and here are the sex hormones uh, 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 that we are particularly interested in in this case. So uh, what we can do, we can uh, um, expose these cells to uh, our test compounds, and then we have a particular interest in whether they interfere with the production of, uh, of acetyl, 70 beta acetyl, the female hormone, testosterone, the male hormone, and also we have a closer look at progesterone, which uh, as you may know, is also called the, uh, the, the uh, pregnancy uh, hormone. And it's a very important inter intermediate uh, hormone in these pathways that ultimately lead to the production of testosterone and estradiol. So we do this uh, with the LC method. Uh, we will do this and uh, we are uh, currently in the, in the process of, uh, of doing, making these measurements. One alternative assay also based on endocrine disruption is a, a, a binding assay, as I already told you, where we make use of a purified protein, in this case transtyretin, which is a distributor protein for a thyroid hormone, T4, as you can see here. It uh, can bind to TTR and then uh, it has two binding places and uh, upon binding of the substrate to the protein, uh, the conformation changes and it loses basically its second uh, binding place. And this uh, is a very important uh, protein because it uh, this co very uh, important complex, I should say, because it can deliver thyroid hormones to the target uh, tissues where it uh, where it is used and where it, where it has to function. Now we know that uh, uh, so we make use of this uh, uh, principle uh, using an. Uh, 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 not T4 itself, but a, a fluorescently labeled T4, FITS T4. Uh, and if we, uh, if that FITS T4 is bound to uh, to the complex, then it produces more fluorescence than it does when it is unbound. That possibly has to do with the with the, with the quenching of the fluorescence that happens in a free uh, uh, FITS T4, but not happens when it's bound. So bound uh, FITS T4 has a higher fluorescence than unbound FITS-T4 and we make use of that uh, of that property to look for compounds that can interfere with TTR binding. So we know that uh, for instance PFAS are known competitors of, uh, of uh, TTR binding. So they compete really with the uh, with the free uh, T4 and uh, that means that if they compete then that, then there's more free T4 so we measure in the end uh, less fluorescence. And um, 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 that means also that there is more free thyroid hormone present, uh, which is then available for excretion, for instance. So many, uh, so what we see in animal studies very often is that exposure to compounds that can compete with TTR ultimately lead to a decrease in thyroid hormone levels because there's more free T4 uh, left, which is then uh, excreted from the body. Now, as I told you already, we also have a focus on immunotoxicity and uh, for immunotoxicity, it's it's uh, quite handy to have a more like an intact organism. Uh, so we do this with uh, zebrafish embryos uh, and we uh, this is work that is uh, planned for uh, for next uh, January. Uh, we do this together with our colleague Wilbert Bitter at the Vrije Universiteit. Uh, and uh, we make use here of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fertilized eggs of, uh, of zebrafish that we inject with a, with a, with a bacteria, uh, also re uh, responsible for, for tuberculosis. And uh, we, uh, we then expose the, uh, the embryos to, uh, to the chemicals. And in the end, after 96 hours, uh, we measure what the bacterial load is in these, uh, in these zebrafish. So what we would expect for a chemical that interferes with the, with the, the immune system is that it uh, has a higher bacterial load than a, a control situation, for instance, where there is no uh, uh, interference with the immune system. So the immune system really tries to keep the bacterial load down. Uh, this is one of the assays that we will use with zebrafish. The, the other assay is here in the bottom of the slide. Uh, here we uh, here we expose the uh, the uh, embryos to our test compounds first and what we do then after 72 hours we amputate, amputate the tail fin so we cut off a very small part of the tail fin uh, 
and that leads, of course, to an uh, infection. So what, what you what we will see then is that uh, that macrophages and neutrophils will really migrate towards the tip of the tail, and we can uh, then uh, quantify that. Uh, the presence of these cells uh, towards the, the the cut tail, and uh, what would again what you would expect is that you find a higher immune response if there is no interference with the uh, with the with the immune system, uh, with the innate immune system, I should say. But if compounds uh, interfere really with the system, then we expect that there is a lower uh, response uh, towards this amputated tail fin. Oops. Yes, so that was the first goal uh, that we use our in vitro bioassays for. Uh, so the toxicity profiling of, uh, of the selected uh, substances. Uh, what we also use it bioassays for as a second goal is that we want to, uh, want to um, uh, find and also identify uh, emerging PM substances from the environment. Uh, and I will show you in a second how we do that. Uh, for this purpose, we use samples uh, collected uh, at the, at the German drinking water production location, uh, uh, which is part of the Zero PM project, and uh, which is highly influenced by uh, the River Rhine. Um, we uh, use here selected responsive bioassays, so those bioassays that we know gave a response in our uh, in our screening here, and we use we aim to use these uh, bioassays for this uh, prioritizing. And we use an approach here, which is called uh, effect directed analysis, or also called uh, EDA. Now, what is EDA? Uh, the EDA is that we have an environmental sample. So, so far we have only discussed pure compounds that we test, standards of compounds, but now we take a very complex mixture from the environment. And we make an extract out of that. Uh, we then fractionate that, uh, that, um, that extract uh, based on the chromatography. And then we perform a, a bioassay on all the different fractions that we have for the extract. And in the meantime, we do a non-target screening uh, for the for the compounds present in uh, in this extract, and then in the end we try to combine the two and see for those fractions that give a response in the bioassay, uh, uh, which peaks uh, correspond to that, and can we identify these peaks? Well, we do the fractionation since we are working with the very polar compounds. We do this on the on the LC fractionation system. Um, we have uh, an in-house developed uh, fraction collector, so we can directly uh, collect the the fraction the the the, the elevates from the LC column into uh, different fractions in the, in the 96 well or a 384 wells plate. Um, so we perform the assays directly in, in well plate format, so we have a relatively high resolution of the fractionation, and we also have high resolution uh, MS to uh, to uh, to. To, uh, to record the mass spectra. And ultimately, we combine it to, uh, into an identification uh, based on the famous Shimansky uh, confidence levels. I think it's really cool when you have something in science that's named after yourself, Emma. So uh, congratulations on that. Um, uh, the, 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 what we have had quite some uh, uh, work on so far is uh, getting the extract, actually, um, uh, because um, these polar compounds, uh, they are quite. Uh, uh, they they need another uh, way of sample pretreatment, as we uh, as we are used to when we uh, work with uh, more uh, uh, lipophilic compounds, of course. And that is this is work done by uh, Timo by Gilgev in our lab. Uh, so we use nowadays uh, a multi-layered SPE, and but we also work with the evaporation methods to concentrate uh, the uh, the samples really, so that we can uh, test them also in our bioassays. And this is what this uh, what the principle of EDA is. I should admit this is a spiked sample, uh, but what you see here is, uh, for instance, uh, this uh, transtyritin binding assay that I've just shown you here. So here you see the fluorescence of this Fitz labeled uh, thyroid hormone over the fractions, and you see clear drops in, in, in fluorescence. So that means there is a compound present there uh, that causes, uh, uh, th that competes with the Fitz labeled uh, thyroid hormone for binding to the, to the uh, distributor protein. And we have spiked this uh, sample, this was a blood sample originally, that we spiked with known compounds that can uh, compete with the uh, thyroid hormone for binding to transtyritin. And they can see that there's a nice correspondence between the depth of the peak here and the height of the peak uh, here. So 
uh, this is the idea uh, of uh, EDA that we uh, that the peaks here, the drops here, the fluorescence in this case correspond to the peaks that we find also in the chromatogram. Now, how does this look in practice? This is a picture uh, that uh, Timor has uh, provided from uh, uh, pilot studies from water from uh, the German uh, drinking uh, water location. Uh, so here you see the same biassay again. So you see we have not such deep peaks here. And uh, here you see the chromatogram again. And the the the, the advantages of this uh, of this approach that we can now really prioritize which peaks we have to pay attention to because th these are the peaks that that uh, that uh, are lower than our threshold value that has been set here at 80% of the fluorescence. So we have a first priority to prioritize these peaks here that correspond to uh, the uh, to the drop in uh, fluorescence here. In the meantime, we have uh, uh, developed a, a quite extensive uh, workflow in our lab uh, to to, uh, to work on this uh, to perform these EDA uh, measurements, uh, all boiling down nowadays to three uh, injections of the extract. So one for the fractionation and getting the bioactive fraction, one for the full scan, and one for to obtain also MSMS data. So. In summary, uh, why do we use bioassays in within this European project? Well, first of all, we use the bioassays to obtain these in vitro uh, 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 dose response curves that ultimately, combined with all the other work done in work package six, will lead us to these uh, risk assessment profiles. Uh, that's the first uh, route that we take. The second route is that we use these bioassays to identify new compounds here, and uh, the idea is also that once we have these compounds identified, that we uh, will also test them again in the whole battery of bioassays. Uh, so these are the, the really phase two compounds of the project uh, that we uh, introduced then into our toxicity profiling as well. So we also, oops, sorry. So we also get the uh, in vitro profiles from them and ultimately then this can also be used in the risk assessment. This is the whole idea of using in vitro bioassays within the European, and uh, I hope I explained that well to you. Thank you for your attention. Zero PM, zero pollution of persistent and mobile substances. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under grant agreement number 10103675